Why? Because air, non-humidified air, is not a great translator of heat. So the mechanism of heat delivery, delivering the heat to the body, is actually totally different. And this is why in a lot of the podcasts and stuff like that, the scare tactics where they say, oh, you can't build heat shock proteins in an infrared sauna like you can in a conventional sauna is not, that's kind of a fallacy. Because the air temperature in the sauna is not actually creating heat shock proteins. Your increased core temperature and your hyperthermic response is what triggers the event in the body to make heat shock proteins. So heat stress, look at it like this. If that were true, if you could only make heat shock proteins in a conventional sauna, you wouldn't be able to make heat shock proteins in a jacuzzi, in a hot tub, in a hot bath. So then why are there studies on PubMed and research in other countries that show folks making heat shock proteins using hot bath therapy, right? So we have to expand our minds a little bit and really break down like, okay, is this nonsense? Is this some, you know, keyboard warriors on the internet just perpetuating some, you know, narrative or something? Or is there actually some science related to what's the mechanism of heat delivery? What's causing the hyperthermic response? How long does it take to initiate that? And how long does it sustain it? So for some people, they prefer the high heat of a traditional sauna. No issue with that. For other people, especially people that struggle with illness, they can get a, a great sweat, increased core temperature without subjecting themselves to 200, 220 degree you know, air. They find this more comfortable. No issue. If you want the, you know, the hard hitting high heat of a wood burner, I personally love the idea of you not having to have it plugged into anything. 